born and raised in Corpus Christi, Kathy with a BA and an MBA from the University of North Texas and an MLS from Texas Women's University, my Aunt B's alma mater, currently holds the position of Outreach and Programming Librarian Instructor of Learning Resources at Del Mar College. In 2015, Kathy discovered Unitarian Universalist principles in Victoria, Texas, marking the beginning of her active engagement with the UU community. In 2017, she returned to her roots, embracing the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Corpus Christi, U2C3. Today, Kathy is a vibrant part of the U2C3, of U2C3 serving on the Board of Trustees, and she lends her voice to the choir, volunteers in AV services, collaborates with the worship team, and plays a key role in fostering community growth. Please give a warm welcome to Kathy Westerfield. Hi, welcome. Thanks for coming out on a rainy day. <laughs> Friends, I have a confession to make. The only one of the Unitarian Universalist principles I comfortably know fully and in the correct order of placement out of our seven, well, actually now eight, or soon to be eight, um, is the very first one. <laughs> I keep meaning to review and memorize the simpler children's version that I learned of in the December Festival of Lights uh, service that we had of some weeks back. And I actually took notes, which, you know, that isn't surprising probably, and I know where they are. But now I'm putting that off until a similar, simpler version of the eighth principle is available. That's my excuse. Um, so it is due to the first principle that I even count myself as a Unitarian Universalist. Well, what is the first principle? In the gray hymnal, and, and there's several in here, most of them are behind the grand piano right now, and there's some extras in Hannah's office. It lists it right up there that we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association at Covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. So that's the first one of what's listed in here as seven. Put another way, which I learned, I told you I found the notes from the Festival of Light Service. Another way to say it is respect for the importance and value for all beings. That was actually written on the order of service that I actually kept and didn't get rid of. And then I even wrote on there the slide notes, each person is important. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, but we're going to go and talk a little bit more about it in a moment. But I wanted to give you a little bit of background how I came into UU. So um, there's a reason I chose for the meditation reading, a Catholic prayer, because I wanted to acknowledge my background. I, like many of you, I had a different faith upbringing. I was raised Catholic. And while I sometimes joke that I am a recovering Catholic, um, I don't think it was all bad. I, I honestly, when I was a kid, I found the services boring, and, and uh, I, I must have come out of the wound hating dresses. I, I always associated church with dresses, and once my mom and maybe my dad, but once my parents let up on that, I, I, I didn't complain as much. And once I started falling in love with music, uh, it was a more enjoyable experience for me to do this dreaded thing. And it wasn't so bad for me, and I, maybe that's because I'm cisgender and straight. Maybe there was not as much um, conflict, um, even though I do remember also at a young age, an adult around me, um, and it wasn't my parents, I don't remember who it was, told me so certainly that my pets wouldn't go to heaven. <laughs> and, you know, I look back on it now, and I think, I wonder if they were joking. But they seemed so serious, and I'm, I, as, as a young little girl, I remember thinking even then, how the heck do you know? How on earth could you possibly know? And so that began my, um, early on I started questioning basic religious tenets and the concept of an omniscient, uh, almighty God. And so now I consider myself agnostic. Um, but I do still get reminders, like my, my uh, very Catholic relative in the Dallas area sends me cards. Birthday cards are really nice, but one that I got um, recently said, fear, uh, it, it had a little insert that said, little coloring thing, I would have loved to have color it, except it said, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. <laughs> and that is part of what we're here for today, guys. I, um, I, the concept of original sin is so hard for some of us to, to grasp, you know, um, or that, that we're already at 
and, and I know not all versions of Christianity feel that way. In fact, our roots um, come from a different background. I meant to start a timer, sorry. Um, so, because <laughs> uh, Chatty Kathy, I was very appropriately named and I'm also very nervous. Um, okay, so I wanna share one other fact, oh, thank you. Um, our uh, former minister here, she shared a sermon once. I just want to comment a little bit more about the first principle. She shared a sermon once that there was a debate on the first principle to at some point state all beings, so it wouldn't just be the implied humans, the inherent worth and dignity of all, um, but that was not agreed upon. It's proof that you know people make up religion and there's debate, um, and you use Unitarian Universalists in particular are, are big on debate. Um, so y'all know that joke, right? Uh, I hadn't planned to say this, but uh, some Unitarians have died, and they're, they're in some afterlife, and there's a sign, this way to heaven, and they stand there standing at the sign discussing what heaven is. <laughs> and that's because we're trying to make heaven here on earth, I think, and really. Um, but anyway, the, what ended up happening is the seventh principle is, um, has incorporated the all beings part, and that was adopted in 1985, and that's a future service. So a friend of mine tried to talk me into trying out a UU church when I went to college in the DFW area, but I didn't attend until I lived in Boulder, Colorado. I went a couple weekends in a row. The boyfriend at the time didn't like the crowd size, and honestly, the second sermon topic was really out there. It was like fairies and gardens, and it was really strange. So take heart. If you don't like my talk today, try again. <laughs> Um, because I should have tried again then, just without the boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> so um, when I moved back to Texas, I moved to Victoria, Texas, and I've never told this to my brother, but part of why I moved to Victoria, part of it, yes, I ended up liking small town life when the breakup happened and I moved to Longmont instead of Boulder, but part of it was two of his three boys were still in diapers and Aunt, Auntie Kathy did not want to do diaper duty. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I thankfully discovered this, the church there. I was depressed at first when I moved there. And, um, one of the things that helped me, there were a couple of things, uh, moving to a different apartment with a dog park and, um, going to this Victoria Unitarian Universalist, I think technically fellowship, um, because it was very small. Um, and it took me about five or six weeks where I went to three or four Sundays to decide, yes, this is the place for me. And the sermon topic that did it was the inherent worth and dignity. The, um, a, for, a member of that congregation or fellowship was who was a former Baptist deacon. He did the present. He did his sermon on that, and and we were lay led at that congregation, just like we are now here at U2C3. And it, that really that did it. That I knew this was the home for me. Um, so when I made the decision to move back to Corpus Christi, one of my struggles was actually having a minister. It was triggering for me, I think, to have a person of authority at the pulpit. Um, however, I, I did grow to like Reverend Chris's sermons, um, and I still think the Easter sermon she gave, and I can't remember if it was 2018 or 2019, one of them was amazing, and the other one was good, but like not compared to the previous year. Um, so, but it, it was still one of the best I've ever heard, but, uh, but I've heard some pretty amazing sermons here out of our fellow congregants now that we're lay led. Okay, so the next part of this is what's the big deal with this principle for me? How is this different, if at all, than the golden rule that I and many of us grew up with, being in my case being raised Christian and specifically Catholic faith? After all, this rule is prevalent in some form of religious and philosophical context, from Confucianism to Christianity. So isn't it inherently the same for us that you use? If that's the case, then why was learning about this principle uh, what made me feel like I found a home in the VUU uh, fellowship? Well, I would argue it's not the same, and being an a the academic librarian I am, I found some research to back it up. So <laughs> the first thing we need to do is define it, what, uh, just maybe just refresh our memories, what is the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then I got lost in a rabbit hole of information from this internet encyclopedia of philosophy and learned that the golden rule isn't so egalitarian, whether you are looking at it from an Old Testament or Confucius perspective, very class structured and, and or Jew specific or what, you know, very, um, very 
not non-egalitarian. But so basically it was early Christianity, it was Jesus and Taoism respectively that radicalized the idea of the golden rule, applying it across class, gender, etc. Right? Um, so even and even the New Testament's um, Matthew chapter 22, I wouldn't have known that. I wasn't very that good a Catholic. Um, I had to write it down. Uh, so even the New Testament's love thy neighbor as thyself can be problematic because it presumes that we know how to love ourselves. Given that we may not be loving enough to ourselves, loving our neighbor is best accomplished by referring to prevailing standards. That's the quote, that sentence. So what determines those prevailing standards? Well, it seems that the prevailing standards change when society changes and based on whose voices are currently the loudest. Um, so there are also people who know themselves, but it doesn't mesh with how other folks are, whether that's through individual or cultural variation. As an example, those of you who know me know I am one of those perpetually slightly late people. So it doesn't bother me, that was my dad laughing, so it doesn't bother me at all if someone else is a little late, emphasis on little guys, uh, but someone else might really abhor such behavior. Um, so we could even go more into the platinum rule, which is do unto others as they would want to be done to them, but let's not. <laughs> the other information source I'd like to share is from a Cultures of Dignity organization article by Megan Saxelby, and uh, the article is on dig dignity. It's quite long, actually. So this quote reads, dignity is different from respect. Dignity is a given, but respect is earned or lost through an individual's or a group's choices, actions, and behavior. The quote continues, why does this matter? The second we decide that someone's dignity is negotiable, we have opened up psychological distance between people, the idea that there is an us and a them. When we feel psychological difference from others, it changes how we see them, what we think we owe them, and how we think we get to treat them, end quote. This quote helped me cement um, why, to internally, why the UU principle of, in, of inherent worth and dignity means so much to me. It's why a lot of my past religious experiences and discussions have felt hypocritical to me over time. Not all, but a lot. Um, okay, so I think we're okay on time because I'd like to share with y'all a story on how I spent my Christmas Eve day. I went to four different services. And that means next year, and the next year after that, I don't have to go to any, including here. No. I'm just <laughs> um, so I didn't plan on going to that many, but I couldn't sleep, so I joined my father at his Catholic service on uh, Ocean Drive. It's these nuns with pink habits. It's awesome. Um, terrible music, though. Um, so the priest talked about how Mary must have felt being given the news from an angel of the Lord that she would be bearing a son and his name would be Jesus, which, by the way, from my readings, is a mistranslation. It's supposed to be Joshua. Um, I get that the priest was trying to take Mary's side of things regarding her initial denial about what could be happening, but all I could think of is how people around her would have judged her and made assumptions, no matter what many of us in here, whether or not people in here believe in a virgin birth or in the accuracy of these events. Um, but it, aside from something miraculous like that, it takes two to make a baby. So I, it kind of irks me, like, well, this person's held accountable, but what about the person that helped? Um, so later in the morning, I attended a service that I had planned on attending to support a family member who was singing Christmas carol duets at her church. It's an evangelical Christian church in town. I planned on it since her service meets at the same time as ours, and we did ours at a different time that day. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, my next service was here at 6 p.m., and then finally, while I did not plan on it, I ended up going to Midnight Mass, and some others in our congregation went, too, at the cathedral later that night. And technically, that one was on Christmas, <laughs> not Christmas Eve, right? Um, so while it was great to be able to support a family member's music performance at that 10.30 a.m. service at the Evangelical Church, uh, and it helped get me into the spirit of the season. It was the latter part of her church of service that ultimately left me feeling, left me leaving after the sermon ended with a bad taste in my mouth. It started off with a clip of the movie To Kill a Mockingbird, and the pastor shared afterwards that he thinks of it as one of the best movies ever made. I mean, that seems kind of promising. He used the clip he played of, of kids interfering in what would have become a lynching as a springboard to discuss Jesus Christ as mediator. Now, 
recall that I consider myself an agnostic, but I still thought the argument was sound, assuming I could accept a certain portion of it as correct. But then the pastor proceeded to knock one type of Methodist, and then he spent some time putting down Unitarians. He said, Unitarians used to be all right, closer to the truth in our country's founding, but if you don't know, Unitarian Universalism, Unitarianism and Universalism both have roots out of Christianity and Christianity out of Judaism. So anyway, so he said, we used to be closer to truth in our country's founding, but not now. And just as an aside, the fool either doesn't know that Unitarians and Universalism, Universalists merged in the 60s, or he was way too lazy to say the full name. It wasn't until he said, why even the Pope just recently blessed same-sex couples that I figured out his real issue with the certain group of United Methodists, Unitarians, Unitarians, etc., really evolve, revolves around his thoughts and maybe his training on about LGBTQ, uh, LGBTQ plus acceptance. I shouldn't have read it. That's what threw me off. Um, a different family member asked me after the service um, when I thought of it, and I told him that I thought the pastor could have made his case without putting down other religions. And I also said to him, it was clear to me that the pastor's real issue was with gays. And I told my family member that it boils down to, do you want the Jesus of the gospel or revelations? And that led me on a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a, another rabbit hole where I was researching, because I've been reading a lot, like, did Jesus actually say these things? And, and then people use, well, the Old Testament, no, that's actually, Sodom and Gomorrah is actually about hospitality, not homosexuality. It, it just led me into quite a rabbit hole, and I should probably speed this along. Um, so out of the four services I attended in that 18-hour period, the UU congregation's sermon homily that was given by our own administrator and director of religious exploration, Hannah Kiley, in my opinion, was the best one. Maybe I'm a bit biased, but ironically, she was the only person of the four services I attended who conduct a service without a theology degree or did a master's in divinity. You know, she, and, and then to me, the second best was Midnight Mass. Um, and by the way, it was only those two services, the one here and the in Midnight Mass, where the person doing the homily acknowledge strife around the world that people are facing all the time right now violence and conflicts that hannah did so and so did bishop michael mulvey respectively they they were acknowledging of it i tell you this because i don't ever want to be unwelcoming in that way the way i experienced at my family members church just um as part of a church or individually i, I i'm working I'm a work in progress on my, since I'm a work in progress myself, for this last portion I'll share um, the importance of practicing and improving the application of our first principle. After all, this principle is simultaneously the easiest and the most difficult principle for many of us to abide by. How many of us recite our covenant but then need to be called back into the agreement we have with each other? And when trying to come to grips with, um, or, and how do we, practice thinking someone is worthy outside these doors where it might get a little challenging. When trying to come to grips with good versus evil debate, blogger and UU practitioner Andrew Hydas said, perhaps this means that our first principle is as much for us it is, as it is for those we extend it to, that it's an orientation and a faith that will serve us well in this fallen world. You have to agree with him, fallen world, but anyway, even if a given person has lost or forsaken the humanity to receive it, and it continues just a little bit further, it's the same thing we often hear about forgiveness, that we must forgive as much as cleanse, uh, as much to cleanse our own souls as to absolve others of their transgressions. And um, this made me think of um, forgiveness in other contexts, like Django's service, um, um, just to a couple weeks ago about the agreements that we make with ourselves, um, the meditation, and I was thinking, you know, I'm not actually living this because I'm, I'm, uh, I've made this agreement with I'm, myself that I'm not enough who I am, and I need to think I am exactly who I am, who I need to be in this moment, and that doesn't mean there isn't room for me to be more than I currently am in another moment. I hesitate to say room to grow or more productive or anything similar because it implies that I am not enough in this current moment. And the forgiveness idea extends in other ways. I caught a little bit of an opera yesterday uh, on the public radio station KEDT, and it, was, it caught my eye because, well, I'm a singer, but mostly because it was in English. 
And then it, the libretto um, was actually written, the words to the opera were actually written by Terrence McNally, and my dad um, grew up next in the na same neighborhood as the McNally's, um, and he's a now deceased famous playwright. Play, playwright. The opera was Dead Man Walking, and it was, it was fascinating because the nun that it's based off of um, was invited by an inmate they had been corresponding to, to to be his spiritual guide, and he did terrible things. I mean, but it was about him confessing, eventually confessing, and then her also giving love to him. And so she was asked in an interview uh, before he, you know, right before he died, she said um, she said I love you, and and she was asked what why she said that, and she said, well, I explained that it was love, not romantic love but still the love of one human being for another, I stood for his dignity. So it's an interesting, hard concept, I think, for sometimes for us to grasp. Someone that does, did heinous things, and boy, there's all sorts of things we could talk about. I had notes about a, a poet, Diane Silver, who described her experience meeting Fred Phelps of the Westboro Baptist um, uh, of infamy a couple of occasions um, before he died, and, and, she, and, and it really, she, hate, she had such hatred toward this guy until she thought about applying the first principle after attending a UU service in Lawrence, Kansas. And she concluded three things. One, I'm doing this for me, not Phelps. And there's more I could share, but it, I think we should not worry about that. Two, like everyone else, Phelps was once innocent. Right? You know, she talks about, oh, he, he was at one point someone's baby. Three, I can see an infant's worth and dignity without endorsing the beliefs and actions of the adults. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then I want to, with the like minute I have remaining maybe, uh, go back to Megan Saxelby, um, who she had a, a suggested dignity practices, one of which is to walk through the next week reminding yourself to use dignity to see others. Every person you come across, family member, grocery clerk, someone on the news, etc., say to yourself, no matter how the interaction goes, your initial reaction to them or who they are, we both matter the same amount. See how that impacts your thinking, reframes your interaction, or just makes you pause. Um, this person does say uh, uh, there are some basic di dignity facts, and the first one is denial of dignity is the root of all conflict, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and the more I think about it, the more I think it's true. Now, I just want to, something a little bit paraphrased, just want to end. Um, however, you do not have to respect anyone because respect is earned. So dignity, respect, right? You do not have to continue, you know, you can, uh, you don't have to continue relationships with people if you have the option, sometimes we don't, right? Who do not recognize your dignity, but we always have some choice. Like I'm thinking of a boss, right? You can, there's some things you can do. Um, as the keeper of your own dignity, you get to determine your boundaries. You can pause and remember that we all have dig dignity and we are all equally vulnerable feeling like we don't matter. Um, but in that antisocial behavior is usually an indicator that a deep need has not been met. So I think I'll just end with a quote by Confucius. A fool, I wrote food, <laughs> a fool will learn nothing from a wise man, but a wise man will learn much from a fool.